You can drive by these ruins every day, and if, unless you're really curious, you're not going to stop the car and get out and look at it. The book is to be an advocate for these ruins so people know that they're there and know that they're worth preserving. After years of studying abandoned mills, homes, canals, and villages, our guest today fulfilled his lifelong desire to provide a testament to the creativity, skills, and challenges of those who came before us. Join us as we talk with Charlottesville architect and author Henry Hank Brown about his book, Vanishing History, Virginia Ruins. Come on. Hank, what is it that has always fascinated you about ruins? When I was a young lad in Connecticut, we used to have ice on the mill ponds, and all of the old mills had been abandoned prior to World War II. And as a kid, of course, any opening in a building was just a cave. It was wonderful to get inside, and, yeah. and you saw they left all the machinery there, and it was just a, a, a magical place. So that started, and then, of course, I grew up. And uh, then the next thing I know, I'm here in school at the Architectural School in Virginia, and my aunt, who lives in Scottsville, would allow me to borrow her car. She was a very brave woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I would take the car and drive all around the county, and I would find old buildings. You know, just out there would be a, a turnout shed falling down or the ruin of an old house where somebody lived and raised a family. And at some point you restored a mill, Walker's Mill. Talk about that project. Oh, how, yeah. Walker's Mill was a dead building when I watched it for 50 years fall down. And where was it? It's on the road between Gordonsville and Sismont. And the only thing that saved it was the roof was safe over the entire structure. Mm. And that was long, long hours of wonderful time for me. When was it that you decided, after all these years of, of studying runes and being fascinated by runes, when was it that you decided that you were going to put this book together? Thirty years ago. And it was something that, you know, they say you have a bucket list or you have an itch that has to be scratched. Uh -huh. I had this itch that I had to scratch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would be in the middle of nowhere in Floyd County, walking down a path. This is before I met Kevin. Yeah, the and photographer would, for your book. Yeah, right. exactly. And so I would look and there would be this old mill that was sitting there getting fallen. And of course, I was just attracted to that. And Kevin and I formed a, a relationship where we were really kind of brothers under the skin because he loved to go, look at that, look at that. And I would say, yeah, that's okay, but look at that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so, oh, that's the perfect partnership. Yeah, it was great. It's like a cornucopia of ruins. There's ruins all over the place. It was interesting capturing these places because they weren't, it wasn't always at the most ideal shooting times. Like we did have to shoot in the rain quite a bit. And there was one ruin where I had to hike seven miles into the ruin and then seven miles back. So it was like a 15 mile round hike into the ruins. I was definitely tired after that one. There's such a variety yeah. in this book. We're standing here at Barbersville right. Ruins. Right. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, the thing that I love about Barbersville is, can you imagine Governor Barber saying to his friend Thomas Jefferson, Thomas, I think I'm going to build a house in Orange because I'm the sheriff of Orange. And Thomas would say, well, that's very fine, Governor. Um, and this would be four years before anything was cleared because you had to burn the wood to get the charcoal to fire the brick. You had to find the mud. Right. You had to dig the mud. You had to put it into molds. You had to dry it first, right. and then you had to fire it. And so this is not an easy thing in those days to make a building of this size and stature come out of the ground. So for three or four years, there'd be nothing around here except workmen. So what happened? What happened? This burned. Well, in 1884, Christmas Day, the fire has been said to be many different things. Generally speaking, I go with the thesis that a Christmas tree caught fire. Because they were lit with real candles, with candles. at the time, yep. right. And can you imagine, they actually carried the tables outside on the lawn here and continued their Christmas. Because you couldn't put the fire out. That's right, you, you had, had to no... have water. Right, yeah. right. And 
What's really great too about the ruins here is that they're being preserved. Right, and, and they're, they're being preserved use. in the correct way. And that would be? Well, you, you stay off the ruins as much as you can because it'd be like an oriental rug with a truck walking over it all the time. It'd break down and fall apart mm -hmm. because you're, you're stepping on fabric. We call it architectural fabric. Right. And that is very fragile and it would break down and then after a hundred years you have nothing. And right. people, believe it or not, will go in and pick up a brick and carry it home to Aunt Julie yeah. and give John Julie would use it as a doorstop. Right. Then when Aunt Julie died, went the brick. The ruins just begin to melt. Yeah, and it's see. important to restore them because they tell us so much about our history. Yeah. Talk about that angle too, why well, that's so important. Listen, you know, we can write books about these historic monuments. What this does is allows a person to go up and imagine, just as I did when I was a little boy, things that went on inside these buildings. Right. And so it's not just reading somebody else's history that they've written, you're writing your own history when you see a ruin and you go up to it and you think about it. What I think about most when I'm uh, walking around the ruins is how to best capture them uh, because Mostly, I'm trying to get all the angles. Uh, I may take a hundred and some photos to get five that we need, but that's what I think is most important about this book, is to take people to these places without them actually physically going to them, keeping them in their natural state the best we can. Talk about some of the canals in your book that you've covered. Um, well, one in particular that I like is the, the Potomac Canal because it's the Potomac and Gen George Washington was one of the subscribers to the funds being raised to get this canal. And so it involved a business community. It involved people who were working to build these canals. We have good ruins down in Palmyra. The old mill is still there, the foundation, and part of the old canals are still there. You cover kilns in the book? Whew, yes, did you know that we found through research there were around 179 kilns in the western part of the state. And that's an enormous number. And they made pig iron for the most part. And the reason for it called pig iron, very interesting. They had a form that looked like a, a sow laying on her side. And then all of these little piglets. Oh, wow. And it was a major export from this country to England. Oh, that's just, that's really fascinating. What else is fascinating is that you have whole villages that are ruins. Talk about some of those. Well, you know, Matildaville is mm -hmm. on the Great Falls in, in Washington. And it's marvelous because you can walk through it and they tell a little bit about the town. It's called Matildaville because of the engineer who was working on the, uh, the uh, canal. His wife was named Matilda. Well, once the canal no longer functioned and it was abandoned, people didn't go back. And so the whole town just fell down. The stones are still there. You can see them. And then one of the other ones is over in the valley, which is a, uh, a lot of the old uh, springs over there in the valley are no longer in use. You have warm springs, hot springs, sweet chabelia, and then red sulfur, blue sulfur, right. and all these springs. And the little towns, when the springs went, the little towns oh, just sort of fell, folded right. back into the uh, ground. You've also covered tunnels, railroad stations yeah. in the book. The railroad stations are such a heartbreaking thing because we have them and they're now going out of, they're, they're falling down they're and falling nobody's down. protecting them. Right. And uh, we have three of them in the book, but there are a whole series of them that went all the way from Harrisonburg all the way down to Roanoke. Now the aqueducts and the tunnels must have been built by the same group of uh, Irish, Scotch Irish and Welsh because the, the joining is all the same. If you go up to the joints, you can see that they're the same and the cutting of the arches were all the same. So there's a whole history there of, of people brought over to this country to do a specific thing. Right, and right. The railroads brought and them over. a lot of slaves built a lot of oh, these structures. You know, this slavery is an issue that while is, is finally coming up to the surface. And as you see the brick on this building, look how uniform the brick are. If mm -hmm. they were eight, a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch off, the joints would wander all over the wall. Yeah. There was a, a, a much expertise on the part yeah. of slaves. They tell where we have been as, as not only a state, but 
as a country. You know, there's a lot of industrial history, a lot of farming history. It basically is sort of a sort of a history of the human condition, both as Virginians and both as Americans. And I think it's something that's important to be preserved. And the main goal of this book is to be an advocate for these ruins. A lot of people don't know. One of the things that came out of the League of Nations was guidelines for restoring the damage of World War I. They were then brought in as the Bible for the preservation of, of buildings with the National Park Service, which then morphed into the preservation community. So our thesis, our logic, comes from the League of Nations. Mm. Talk about Minokin, because oh. here's a great example of, yes. of something. That, that is, is just a marvelous example of the extreme that is going on right now to restore buildings. And that is the epitome of it, where they're using glass, structural glass, to keep the weather off of the uh, building fabric. And they're going and they're taking each stone and measuring it and putting it in a pile and finding out where it goes back into the building. And that is just extraordinary. And the only other place I know that's doing that is the, the Acropolis in, in Athens, which I was able to be there. So if you, somebody says, what did a wine cellar look like? You can say, well, I was at Minokin and I walked in that wine cellar. So tell us about Mary Mill, which is right down the road in Sismont. Well, built by Colonel Thomas Walker's son. Same sort of structure, same sort of beams and, and configuration. As, as, as Walker's as Mill. As Walker's Mill, and stone, stone foundation, brick above, with uh, wood, gorgeous building. And I'm sure someone's going to restore that. It takes a lot of time and effort to get involved in something like that. Hank, thank you so much for spending time with us today. This has been really fascinating. I appreciate it. Well, you've given me an opportunity to express some of the things that I have been trying to get Virginians and, and the rest of the nation involved in. Thanks a lot for having me.